Ties from Nowhere, How Georgia Gilmore Sustained the Montgomery Bus Boycott by D. Romito, illustrated by Laura Freeman. When Georgia Gilmore was a young girl, she lived on a farm in Alabama where she fed the pigs and milked the cows. Georgia did her best to listen to what her mother taught her. Think twice before doing anything you might regret and never hate anyone. Georgia grew up and soon had a family of her own. She did plenty of cooking along the way. And when it was time for something sweet, she knew just what to do. She'd blend butter and sugar in a bowl to get her homemade pound cake started and then add tea bags to a pot of water for a new batch of sweet tea. Georgia was a cook at the National Lunch Company in downtown Montgomery, Alabama. Because of segregation laws, the restaurant counter was separated into two sections, one side for white customers, one side for black customers. Georgia knew it was wrong, but that was the way things had always been. On December 1st, 1955, Georgia was working at the restaurant when a news alert came over the radio. A black woman named Rosa Parks had been arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a bus to a white passenger as the law demanded. Already a civil rights activist, Rosa was tired of giving in to rules that were unjust, and she wasn't the only one. The next day, an association of black women distributed a flyer asking people to boycott public transportation on Monday. It said, please stay off of all buses. Georgia watched as buses drove down the street, one after another, empty, empty, empty. Because she'd been treated poorly by the white drivers so many times before, Georgia hadn't ridden the buses for two months. Still, she wanted to be a part of the movement she saw growing. Not long after, she went to Holt Street Baptist Church to hear Reverend Ralph Abernathy and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak. The church was full. The crowd overflowed onto the street outside. Large speakers had been set up so thousands more could hear. Dr. King spoke about doing good things for one another. He talked about freedom, unity, equality. We are determined here in Montgomery to work and fight until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Those were things Georgia believed in and she was willing to fight for them. So Georgia decided to help the best way she knew how. She worked with a group of women in her community and together they purchased the supplies they needed, bread, lettuce, and chickens. And then off they went to cook. The women brought food to the meetings that followed at the church. They sold sandwiches. They sold dinners in their neighborhoods. As the bus boycotters walked and walked, Georgia cooked and cooked. And boy, did the people of Montgomery love her food. Georgia's group donated the profits from their sales to the Montgomery Improvement Association, which helped fund the boycott. But if anyone had found out these women were involved, they could have lost their jobs. So Georgia ran the operation and the other woman acted as secret helpers. See, the way I figured it, people always had to eat, so I made the pies, said Georgia. The woman sold baked goods to stores, groceries, laundromats, and beauty shops in their neighborhoods, and people paid in cash so they wouldn't be connected to aiding the boycott. Sweet potato pie, peach pie, Red Velvet Cake, 7-Up Cake. Only Georgia knew who baked them, and only Georgia knew who bought them. Every Monday and Thursday, 
Georgia would go early to the boycott strategy meetings at the church. She'd walk up to the collection plate and announce how much her group was contributing. There was cheering, clapping, foot stomping. But whenever people asked where the money came from, she remembered her promise to keep it a secret. It came from nowhere, she'd say. Because of this, her brave group of women bakers became known as the club from nowhere. The club not only raised enough money to purchase gas for the carpool system that had been set up for the boycott, but they were also able to buy station wagons to aid the effort and help get people where they needed to go. But Montgomery didn't want their buses continuing to lose money, so the city did what it could to stop the protesters in their efforts. Dr. King and 89 others were arrested for their roles in the boycott, and Georgia was called to speak in court about an instance when a bus driver had mistreated her. After she had already paid, the driver demanded she get off and enter through the back of the bus as black riders were forced to do at that time. When I reached the back door and was about to get on, he shut the back door and pulled off. I didn't even ride the bus after paying my fare. So I decided right then and there, I wasn't going to ride the buses anymore. Georgia testified. Georgia knew she was doing the right thing by standing up for her fellow protesters, but news of the trial spread across the country like wildfire. When the National Lunch Company found out she was a part of the boycott, she was fired from her job. Georgia employed in raising six children on her own. She needed to find a way to support her family. Dr. King encouraged her to start her own business. All these years you've worked for somebody else. Now it's time you worked for yourself, he said. He helped her improve the kitchen in her home and Georgia got new pots and pans and cooking supplies. Word soon got around and people came to eat at Georgia's. When they came to her house for a meal, they would eat wherever they could find a seat. And if they couldn't find a seat, they'd eat standing up. Georgia loved to talk and joke with her customers and friends. Soon enough, there were long lines to get a meal cooked by her. People ordered meals for delivery too. Georgia was making hundreds of lunches each day. She packed up fried chicken, black-eyed peas with okra, fresh corn muffins, and apple pie and sent her kids out to deliver them. If you were lucky, you might even get her homemade macaroni and cheese. She was providing good food for her community, but she was also bringing the people of Montgomery together, black and white. Dr. King frequently had meals at Georgia's house. Because she was a big woman with a big personality, he lovingly called her Tiny. And because civil rights leaders knew they could trust Georgia, her home became a place for important and often secret meetings. I just served them and let them talk, she'd say. On November 13, 1956, Georgia was cooking in her kitchen, listening to music on the radio, when the station interrupted the song to deliver the news. The Supreme Court had declared the segregation on buses was illegal. The boycotters had won. Georgia was thrilled. People could ride the bus and sit anywhere they desired. Meeting, Georgia sat in her seat and listened as Dr. King announced that the Montgomery bus boycott was a success. We didn't have to walk no more, said Georgia. Even before Martin Luther King Jr. got up there and told us it was over, we knew it was over and we knew we had won. Still, there would be more battles to fight. So Georgia Gilmore kept right on cooking. The end.